Hi, welcome back to Till Death Do Us Watch Party. Sorry. <laughs> I love the emphasis. You went watch party? That's great. <laughs> I thought it would work. Till Death Do Us Watch Party? I like your way better. All right. <laughs> Anyways, I'm Amber. This is Lance. And today we're going to be reviewing The Legend of Box Machina, Season 2, Episode 3. And so, here's our quick rundown of it. And so, if you have not watched this episode and you do not want to be spoiled, I recommend putting a pause, going to Amazon, watching that third episode, and coming back to finish this video. If not, or you're okay with spoilers, stick around and let's get right into it. Who watches two people review a video before they go and watch the You know, part? there are people who do. Let's, let's not judge. Let's not judge. Knock it off. Stop making our job harder. Hey! No judging. No judging. Fine. You don't know what people have to do in their life. Maybe, maybe they're trying to figure out if it's for them and they're trying to get an idea of what to expect. No judging. I'm judging. No, we don't judge here. Anyways, let's get into The Legend of Vox Machina, Season 2, Episode 3, The Sunken Tomb. Dun, dun, dun. So, when we rejoin our intrepid adventurers, they are heading out of Vasselheim to the lake where the Osisa has told them they can find the temple or rather tomb uh, belonging to one of the matron of Raven's champions. Um, was his name Pervon? We get, we'll get there. We'll get there. Um, but they, they um, before we actually get to them looking for that lake, we have Pike suddenly backing him on. Oh no! Dun, dun, dun. Thordax there, and with him, all the other members of the Chroma Conclave. This really rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Chroma Conclave. Chroma Conclave. You know when Matt wrote that shit, he was like, "Fuck yeah!" <laughs> <laughs> like that, that just that's great. language. Sorry, YouTube, don't demonetize us. Anyways, I said puck. Anyways, um, Thordax seems to be disinterested in the meager offerings the citizens of Amon are bringing him at this moment. So he pretty much just roasts most of the people there alive and we get a slight worry perhaps Pike was there, but fortunately for us, she was just scrying and that just went horrifically awry. Or it was a vision? I think it was a scry. It felt like a scry. Mm, okay. You know, if you're scrying, you can sometimes feel like you're in the moment, in the scene. Um, so we get there and, uh, you get back to the main cast. They don't really seem to ask her too much. She just tells them, Hey, bad stuff's still happening. I'm on. So they continue on. Uh, Vax happens to find, uh, the lake, which is weird. Cause you would think that would be Vex's job to be the one searching out and tracking. If we're going to go with stereotyping based on, uh, character class, Ranger would probably be the one out scouting for, natural locations more than the rogue but well, that naturally they get there and they're like lake no temple well i guess she lied to us right you know, the very first thing i soon as as soon as they rolled up on it, i said that shit's underwater because <laughs> it can't be easy it can never be easy so um there th there's a little bit of debate back and forth and scanlon's like hey guys no worry i'll skate across this pond he uses his fun um magic and shows off a little bit of a foot fetish and goes uh Ice skating across this frozen pond, only get attacked by fish people. <laughs> Daro? Um, I'm not sure exactly what they call them. It, they're effectively like the Kua Toa mm. in uh, certain editions. However, uh, named differently and I think done up a little differently. I think they're much larger than what Kua Toa are in traditional Dungeons and Dragons. Right. Um, but, you know, fortunately for them, Cash and Zara save the day. <laughs> mm. Apparently, they're at least following them under the guise that Osisa sent them after them. Is that true? Is it not? Who knows? Anyways, um, they agree that maybe they should at least camp for the night. Wait till day because apparently the fish people like to hunt during the dusky hour. So probably best to lay low until they won't be so agitated for food. Plus, you know, like some people were like, oh, no, I used two first level spells. I need to take a long rest so I can get them back. You know, I've, I've been there before. Mm. So, but they take a camp. Um, Vex and uh, Vex and Vax, 
they uh, sit in the trees. Then they're like, yeah, we don't trust anybody, especially them. Well, they kind of trust the other members of Vox Machina, but they really don't trust Cash and Zara. Probably with good reason. Um, and you start getting treated with some flashbacks um, as to like their backstory at this point, mm -hmm. which that was all new information. Like Oops. some of the particular scenes, like in campaign one, you see some of the stuff. You, you hear about some of their stories, but you don't see them. Um, but I have heard from a friend that the book Kith and Kin, which is a, a, a novel for those two characters, has been put out by, I think, um, their publishing company, that Kith and Kin does go into some similar kind of details. And, and it has a similar motive where it flashes back between past and present day. So it feels like it's kind of mirroring that a little bit, probably to help give them some sideways sales towards their other properties. Star Wars. If you wanted to know who this character is that we introduced, just shut a red the well, box. Well, they're not doing that for the introduction. They're just giving you some, like, tidbits. And, and they're not saying you need to know it. I mean, trust me, you're going to learn more about their father as the season goes on. Okay. That's not, not going to happen. Um, but... Um, Daybreak rolls around and um, Cash flirts with Keyleth some more. Uh, they get Keyleth to use wind magic to blow the lake apart. And then Zara uses, funny enough, warlock magic because that's what she is, unless they've changed it, um, to, to hold the water at bay so they can get in to the tomb and are almost thwarted yet again by a door. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's a pull, buddy. <laughs> um, they happen to jog right in there and uh, cast on some light. And yeah, now they're just in a creepy underwater tomb. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about you, but this is at the point where my uh, years of playing D&D &D kicked in a little bit. And it's like, why isn't the rogue standing about 15 feet in front of everyone saying, I search for traps? I search for traps. I search for traps. He even brings up, there's probably traps, and yet he's not insisting to be out ahead. So I feel like every time someone stumbles across a trap, it's like, did Vax really try hard enough? <laughs> so whenever I play a rogue, and I haven't played one in the, some of the latest editions of stuff that's out, but like what I used to like doing was like I'll get out in front of the party, and my character, my my rogue always had chalk. Mm -hmm. So, like, I would basically get out in front of the party, and as I spotted things, I would circle things with chalk and be like, don't stand here. Don't touch this. Don't do this. Don't do that. Just so, like, if the GM was like, oh, you stumble on this thing, and it's like, no, you said I found it. I circled it in chalk. Yeah. Um, just so, you know, because we had a GM at one time that we were uh, walking through temples, and because we had been playing so long, uh, the tiles that he was laying down for us had, like, a little symbol on it. And it was in the very middle of the room between some columns. And we would walk into a room, skirt along the outer edges, and walk into the next room. And the GM goes, why aren't you guys walking through the middle? <laughs> why aren't you walking through the middle? And we're like, well, I did. and he's like, well, you know, it looks like a trap, but it doesn't mean it's a trap. So one of our, one of our players went, uh, okay, and then I walked through the middle. And he was like, it's a trap. And so it, it, the floor fell away. There were rats that were, like, biting him and everything like that. So guess what we did from then on? <laughs> Skirted the edge of the room. Yeah, but, you know... And, and, and this is not knocking uh, anything that they did. It's just, it, it felt like for as much that Vax brought out attention to the fact that this place is likely full of traps, he didn't do a good enough proactive job of trying to help with that. Now that doesn't, you can be try to be proactive and your party can be just like, I walk on ahead. And then and that, that's bad party cohesion in my opinion. If you feel there's a credible threat of traps, maybe listen to your trap finder. That's all I'm saying. They clearly don't do that. And because of that, the party gets separated. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, no. I got to say, I did think it was funny that, like, uh, Grog found the first one, and he was like, oh, I'm going to stomp this back on the floor so nothing happens. Then the trap goes off 15 feet ahead of him. So that was like one of those traps that was like the last person fails their uh, perspective. And it kills your bro. And it basically kills the people at the front of the party. That shit's hilarious. Yeah. It doesn't hurt the person who tripped it. It hurts the people out front. Yeah. And, and, and Grog, again, is the one who activates the trap that splits the party. Yep. Grog stumbled into every trap. And it's like maybe, maybe at the very least, Vax should have been 
handcuffed or manacled to grog and been like grog no no don't stand here grog don't touch that you know somebody should have been like okay let's let's handhold grog through this encounter what was but even they didn't. what was even more hilarious than that is it wasn't like i didn't see it and i step on it the first one he saw and was like this is a high stone i'm gonna i it. love that part i will kid you not because Travis has always played up uh, Grog's six intellect so well. Because Grog has a six. Right. On a scale of 18, yeah. he has a six. Yeah, and they say that three is like understanding. Like, three is like dog. Understanding what you say but can't communicate. Then you start breaking into four where it's like you can communicate. This dude's rocking a six. Yeah. So And then Travis has always played it well. And you can, if you watch the campaign, you can see sometimes, at times... Travis struggled to play down his natural intelligence to the six because that can be rough. But I feel like you can, they zoomed in on his grog's face when he saw that stone and he was like, should I touch this? They told me not to touch it. But in his head, you can see that, that poor old decrepit hamster trying to run on that wheel <laughs> to spin the cogs. And he's like, no, someone would trip on this. I'm going to step on it to make sure no one trips. And you can just see that that long Mac. It's that meme of that woman staring at the long calculus. Oh, yeah, doing the math in her <laughs> yeah, head. Yeah, and, it, and it's like that's Grog gone. Should I touch this rock? <laughs> I, th I think that's what I love best about it is that he saw it and was like he made the decision. You know, I'm going to stomp this down. It could be dangerous for like my party or like, you know, yeah. someone could trip on this. The second trap. He didn't see. No, that was and a grabbed step. it by accident, yeah. which separated the party. And then they do a later scene where he sees yet another thing, and he's like, "I wonder." And the only thing I could think of the entire time I was watching that was like the Ren and Stimpy Space Madness <laughs> episode, the red candy-like button. Will he push it? Like, yeah, shit was hilarious. They they at least stopped him from the third one, but the party gets split, <laughs> uh, and and you follow the first party, which is um, Grog and Pike. And um, you have Trinket, Vex, and Zara. It's mm. pretty much it. Everybody else got separated um, in the second half of the group. And they're going along, and they hit a, a, a large water area. And you see poor Pike struggling uh, to keep up. And, and thankfully, Grog saves the day and puts her up on his shoulders. And having played the small character before, I can track that that is 100% believable. Because if you get into water that's knee high maybe waist high for most of the party members and you're playing a sub three foot character you need someone to carry you it's not it's not diminishing it's not shameful it's a necessity and she's talking about a, a game that we played where she was playing a um, gnome no yeah i was playing a gnome. and i was playing a shifter that was like six foot five or something mm -hmm. like that and like her character, I was carrying her around so much through like hostile terrain that I made like this little, uh, in my leather armor that I was wearing, I made like a little thing on my shoulder on this side, which was almost like a little saddle. <laughs> so like she could basically just kind of get up there and sit. So she had like a way to hang on if I had to run or whatever. Yeah. Um, so the GM like let my character like make a little custom saddle yeah. shoulder thingy. It was, it was, it was fun. Yeah. So we, they get into the next room and uh, more fish people attack. Because apparently the fish people have made a home of this tomb. Um, they run across Fishy Mage, uh, shades of Mumra in his design. I actually thought that was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, and just as things look bad for this group, the split party, who we had not seen, arrives. And uh, they save the day. Um, Kashaw falls off uh, Scanlan's hand. Um, Oops, his magic mouth, and they don't really care. So you can see the rivalry between uh, the Slayer Takes members and Fox Machina still going strong. Um, during the fight, uh, Grog goes into a strange bloodlust as he's killing fish people. We'll get back to that. Um, and then they uh, gather together and are about to make to make sure everyone's okay. And they realize Kasha and Zara aren't with them anymore. They've continued on. You see them uh, approach an area with a, a bunch of tombs. Uh, Shaw uses some sort of magical spell, whether it's like detect magic, divine the path, locate something doors. instead of locate object, perhaps. Um, he he follows that, and they go through one door. Um, you see another flicker of glow after they've left through that door um, on the ground, suggesting perhaps they missed something. Then you get over and uh, the Vox Machina appears. That's when they slap Grog's hand to keep him from tripping yet another trap. Um, 
Vex, uh, I mean, not Vex, I'm sorry, Vax. Don't worry, that happens a lot in game too. <laughs> um, he tells everyone, don't move, don't touch anyone, stay put. He goes and explores a hole in the ground, uh, finds a mural uh, for the Matron of Ravens. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Percy and Vex didn't listen to the rogue, and they uh, pushed together a tie loose tile on the floor. Uh, turns out it raises a sarcophagus. There you go. I was going to stumble over that word, so I'll let she was you say sarcophagus. I always do. I don't know why. Oh, sarcophagus. There we go. Um, and again, rather than waiting for the rogue, they decide we're just going to push this lid open. And, and sure enough, the uh, remains of Pervon Soul, the uh, champion. Pervon. We'll get back to that. Uh, uh, is is there in the Death Walkers ward? Um, and they're trying. The rest of the party members are trying to get Vax's attention to get him out of the pit. Um, but before they can, um, Percy reaches down, touches the armor. Triggering yet another trap in this dungeon. It goes off and it spears Vexalia mm. with black magic, which could only be of the necromantic variety, necrotic damage. And she crumples to the floor, lifeless. Straight iced, yo. And you see just vax wrecked over this and in the most rudest of fashions the episode ends <laughs> so lance <laughs> she's fine <laughs> something it did there's some thing there where it's like oh no she's dead no she's not dead um i don't like so okay there are certain things i don't like about the show um, or at least the characters. I don't like that Keyleth is always like, I don't know. It's like, you're 10th level. You, you should have a good grip on yourself. Um, but that's the character she's playing. That's fine if that's like your character is just not confident. But there has to be a certain amount of confidence by 10th level. Yeah. Because you're powerful at that point. Um, you shouldn't be doubting like the things that you're doing. Like, you know, the... The, uh, the walking through the the roots mm -hmm. and stuff like that. That shouldn't be something you're trying very hard to do. That should be something that be, should be rather practiced. But if that's your character's bit, more, more power to you. It just drives me nuts. Um, and it's like um, the, the thing they're doing with the... Um, some of the characters' overconfidence. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I didn't like how, like, Percy was kind of goading her to, let's open the, let's open the tomb. After, I will. I will say that straight from the game, though. Oh no! I'm, straight from the game. I'm sure of that. Percy did that in game too. In the in the in the campaign, he was all he was just like, oh. And I think at this point, I think Vexalia had taken one or two levels of rogue, so she technically had trap finding, but she was multi class, so she wasn't as skilled at trap finding as say the rogue. <laughs> yeah. Don't touch anything. Don't touch anything. Stand here. Don't touch anything if he said it once he, he said, said it a thousand times yeah and i know i got on him for maybe not being proactive early on in the temple but he he can't control what other people do and you know he really tried to tell them don't touch anything and they they, they just didn't listen oh i i bet they'll listen now i hope they listen now it's just like that's <laughs> that's my job like, if i would have been him i'd be like great my sister's dead um what did i say don't touch anything. Uh, uh, trap binding and keeping your ass alive, it's my job. Uh, raising my dead sister, that's your job, by the way, which you wouldn't have had to do if you would have just not touched the sarcophagus. So <laughs> Yeah, right? So. But what I was saying about that was like the cleric. She's always like, please help me, patron. If your patron is literally like eating pizza and watching a football game, it's like, hmm, you need healing? Okay, I'll help you. You know, like it's it's... It always seems like she's begging so, that guy to give her power. So I, I will say in defense yeah. of Pike in this is the fact that Ashley Johnson was missing from many of these episodes. She actually was not in a lot of these episodes because of her um, filming schedule for the TV show she was starring in at the time. she's famous, y'all. Um, 
So she, I think they're having to find ways to insert her character and not upset the balance of what happened in certain areas because she was not originally at the tomb. So I think they're trying to find a way to make her character more integrated without having to do like the astral projection that was they did for a good portion of episode season one where they were, um, yeah. Well, it's uh, you've. Oh, I, I don't even think they did astral projection. That was just what they did in the campaign. My bad. Well, she was like skyping in, right? Yeah, she. Yeah, or, or, or sometimes if they needed to have the cleric there and she couldn't be there, Matt would NPC her, and her character was just actually projected. That's fine. It's one party does not. The one one monkey does not stop a circus. Yeah. So if she was out doing her job. By all means, yeah. go make that bacon. But, um, yeah, she's not dead. It's it's a cliffhanger. I'm pretty sure that particular episode on uh, the channel uh, was like that's where they ended the episode. You know, she's they dead. typically leave off at character deaths. They, they um, because in Matt's when Matt runs a game, he likes to have more stakes in character death, so it's not as simple as just casting a spell and having the reagents. Hmm. There's a, a little bit more of a ritual. Um, there's a DC check that has to be made and it starts off low and gets higher the more you've been resurrected. Um, because, you know, in a world where there's a god of death that is like, no, no, you, you need to obey by the laws of, nat you know, the, the laws of nature and, and have natural death. Having magical ways to bring people back from the dead is kind of a front to her. So, excuse me, they end up having um, ways to try to keep that in balance, keep that in check. I mean, uh, um game changing effects have diminishing returns no it's like it's what is it like 300 300 in diamonds to, that that's for a raised dead yeah but like no the, no that's a that might be a revivify yeah that that price should go up or it's like if your character comes back at that you can't use that next time yeah you have to go with the next step to bring you back yeah well it, it, which it sounds like that's what he's kind of kind of it kind of but like like say you died you might have a DC eight and then there's a ritual that only so many people can participate in and then they can use any relevant skill that they feel would be useful so they're not locked into needing to have a certain skill mm -hmm. is what do they feel they could use through what they're doing as a way to connect themselves to that character to help bring the soul back mm -hmm. and then what they did was. Um, they rolled, and if they passed, it lowered the DC. If they failed, it raised the DC. Hmm. So it, it gave it gave real stakes. So typically, whenever a character died, Matt would end the game. Typically, unless it was super early, um, because then he could a talk to the player, find out what they wanted. Because sometimes he might use it out if somebody wasn't enjoying a character. Did they want to re-roll them? So let me ask you this by game rules of what they were playing, and I think we all know what they're playing, was the character dead or were they making saves? Dead. Okay. So She failed her con save. When that trap hit, she went straight to dead because she took the, the narcotic damage, took her to zero, and the way that the trap was written was if your hit points were reduced to zero, you die. Save or suck. So yeah, Go. so it was, it was kind of like a power word kill. If you have a hundred, you know, if your hit points are less than a hundred and you get hit with power word kill, you just die. It was kind of like, if your hit, if you have less, she took damage. If it reduced you to zero hit points, you die. Like disintegrate. If you take, if the damage from a disintegrates reduces you to zero hit points, you, you turn, turn to dust. dust. This, the trap was written is, if your hit points reduce you to zero hit points, you die. So I'm going to guess, I, keep in mind, I don't listen to the episodes. Um, I'm going into this fresh. She's going into it with a little bit of knowledge. Um, the armor's going to save her. Or the patron's going to show up. Something's going to happen to bring her back. They're not going to finish the temple without her. Yeah. So okay. that's that's just my guess. I could be we'll completely wrong. We'll see what wrong. happens. Um, Maybe I've been pulling your leg this whole time and Vexalia died there and Laura rolled up a new character. I have walked through the room enough to hear you listening to certain parts <laughs> to know that the character's <laughs> still alive. Um, if only You don't know. If you only, don't know. Yeah, so I know that when you watch them on YouTube, it had like character portraits and then like their hit points things. 
So, and I... You've seen me watch a lot of different Critical Role, though. You don't know which one it was. That's yeah, true. Um, but, like, usually they have the character portrait. I don't know if I was watching it. Anyways, <laughs> neither here nor there. She's not dead. That's... It, all D- right. D&D 101, if the character is a beloved character and it's like their first death, usually there's some kind of, oh, you done, screwed up okay. uh, moment, and then they come back. All right. Standout character for you this episode. I'm going to say Mumra. Mumra? You, yeah. you, you like the He was dope. Mumra. I, I like that all of his magic was water-based. They shot the arrows or did the thing mm-hmm. at him. He raised the water wall. Then he did the water torrent at them. And then, like, basically kind of flooded them in, like, the, the water tornado. Mm-hmm. Like, all of it was based on his element that he exists in. Yeah. And when they saw him, they were like, ah, crap. Yeah. So, I, I really liked him. I think he got punked. Oh, yeah. By a natural 20 to the back of the head. Yeah. Um, I, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more of that fight. But, um, yeah, I really liked him. Um, I really liked Grog. Uh, whenever he's like when he was going berserker on the um, mm-hmm. the fish people, and then you saw like those eyes turning red and that strain um, from the vampiric blade. Uh, I can't wait to see what they do with that. Yeah. Um, I thought it was funny in the second episode when you pointed out the fact that the sword was like I hunger, and he's like, yeah, I can use a bite too. Like I didn't hear that the first time. Yeah. Um, and as we all know. Uh, if you pick up a weapon in D and D and it talks to you and it says anything other than "Hi, friend, let me help you," you throw it in the ocean. <laughs> so, all right. Well, for me, my standout character, I would have to say, I'm, I would have to go with with Vaxel Don. Uh, the the palpable grief. Palpable. Palpable grief between. Palpable. Um, that he showed in the end of the episode. And um, all the little tidbits of him and, and, and Vex, like, in their flashbacks. I really liked, like, how he stood out in that. And I'm not normally a big Vex fan. Mm-hmm. Um, I think if I was in my uh, more gothy phase youth, uh, Vex would have been my character of choice. That, uh, you know, he's very much the kind of emo boy and that would have spoken to me when I was much younger as a as an older lady now. I'm like, nah, it's a little bit too emo for my liking. So I'm not normally his biggest fan, but Liam really sold the um the grief. That that felt real. When I've been when I've watched you playing, and this is just my impression, um, name the the actor. Uh, Liam seems like he's in it. Like, he seems to be the person who's taking it very seriously and, like, role-playing the entire time. Um, the guy who plays Scanlan? Sam. Sam. He seems like he's definitely in it for the storyline, but he's looking for the for the dick jokes. Sometimes. Um, uh, but don't get me wrong, I love him. Um, Ashley is the one who plays Keyleth? Pike. Pike. She, she plays Pike. I really like her, char- I really like her character. Um, it's just... Like, I, I feel like once you get past, like, third or fourth level, you sure character should kind of, like, be a little bit more... Um, yeah, but again, through. but again, I feel like the, the fact that she wasn't able to play consistently yeah, has no, always been Ashley's that. bad. Then that's why I think in the third campaign, you really see Ashley really starting to shine is because she's being able to consistently play, and she's really thriving in that. Mm. I want to put a challenge out there. I like the backstory of, like, the half-elf twins that, mm-hmm. you know... Um, that I need you, and this one needs like the the, the approval, of her father. approval of her father. My challenge to you is when you make a character backstory for your next character. My next character is going to be like um, he was raised in a rich family. His parents are still alive. He's got plenty of money. Mm-hmm. Uh, nothing's wrong. He was just bored. Yeah, and was like, I'm going to pick up a sword and just go adventuring. Yeah. Like, that's, yeah, like, my parents, are, it, it's, when he walks into the scene, it's not like, I'm brooding because people don't like me. No, it's going to be sunshine, lollipops, and so, so So, and you want to play someone like Dahlia, my character Dahlia, whose parents were retired adventurers, famous, and, and she, she decided she wanted to go make her own name and have fun, and she didn't have uh, the traumatic background? Amber, <laughs> three weeks uh, before this character was made playing Star Wars Galaxies went, oh, look, another person who has written into their backstories that the Imperials killed their parents. And now they 
our rebels. Huh. All right, what's this guy's backstory? Oh, uh, rebels killed their parents or their sister. Yeah, like I remember you going through people's bios and everything like that, and you're like, oh, everyone has a tragic backstory. Just, it doesn't have to be tragic. <laughs> Like literally, no, you could be a, you could be a farmer who found a but, sword in but a field. If you want the tragic backstory, because that's what's appealing to you and your character, by all means, play what you want. But don't feel like you have to be shoehorned into that trope. Again, in one of the old games, I remember uh, I played a farmer because uh, the GM started us at level zero, and I played a farmer, and I was tending to my field. I found an old rusty sword in the field, and I picked it up and went, "Cool." And then the ground shook. My character stumbled. I stabbed the sword into the ground to retain my foot, which stabbed into a boule that was just underneath me. And it didn't mess with me. It just kept on going. And I was like, huh. And then someone went, that's uh, an underground boule. And I went, cool. My character knew what it was. I stabbed it, which gave me enough experience to go to first level. Like, and that's how we started his adventuring. I don't like, oh. I don't like hoeing fields anymore. I just want to go out and like- And kill boule. And kill stuff. Uh, to make the land safer. Just, just let's get more creative with our backstory. Hey, you know, but maybe they came up with a real creative, tragic backstory. It's, like I said, I think it was their first campaign of all them playing together. Yeah, and but they... I'm saying, you, lovely viewer, you may have come up with a, a tragic backstory, and that's okay, too. You do you. You enjoy your tragic backstory if that's what you've chosen. Sure. <laughs> All right, so is there anything else that you would like to add to this? Well, I think you've already kind of hit everything else. Um, you know, standout scenes, you know, you've hit them all. Um, we've gone over, you know, standout characters, and um, you kind of already made your prognosis for what you think is to come. Will Vex be resurrected, or will Laura be playing a new character? Only you will know, noble viewers, come uh, Legend of Vox Machina Season 2, Episode 4, coming out soon. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and make a prediction. Her character dies, and they're like, no. And then all of a sudden, a fish, a, a female fish person comes out the next room and goes, Hey, guys, uh, I heard that you lost <laughs> a party, Reverend. I know this temple ra rather well. Or maybe I can <laughs> show you around something. And that's the character she's going to play. That would be life. hilarious if true. Let's find out. And until then, uh, have a lovely evening and a good day and enjoy your time. Until then, bye. Go experience your day. <laughs>